folks, hello and welcome to our game with myself, Shane Stanton, joined as always by Michael Burney. We're looking back at a big weekend of football, the All-Ireland Football Final was on, and Dublin have claimed their 31st title. Michael, it's only back in 2009 that Kerry were 14 titles ahead of Dublin. That's now been cut in half. The dominance has been unbelievable, but um, I think this is a huge one for Desi Farrell because a lot of people would have said in 2020 when they won that COVID All-Ireland in front of nobody, basically, at Croke Park, only us few journalists, that this was um, Jim Gavin's team still winning. He's had to rebuild. He made the gamble of bringing back some big players, and it, it just about worked out, like 115 to 113. So it's a huge achievement for him, and obviously for the likes of James McCarthy, Michael Fitzsimon, Stephen Cluxton winning their ninth. So it's uh, pretty brilliant for them. Like six in a row became routine. This was different. Yeah, all the chances that they took, all the chances that Daisy took, all the, the chances that McCaffrey took, the chances that the chance that Mannion took, that Cluxton took, they all paid off in spades. They all came back for one reason, and that was to win All Ireland. And uh, they did so yesterday. And I'd say, like Shane, you looked out in the pitch after as much as I did, I'm sure. Like they got more satisfaction out yesterday, I'd say, than probably 2011 is the only one that compares to it, I'd say, uh, as regards the, that, the satisfaction they got over. It's just looking down at Jack McCaffrey, and I'd say he had probably drawn a line. He'd probably drawn a line in his footballing career, and it just, I just, he was standing just about 10 yards below McCarthy, and I just watched him for the 10 or 15 seconds before McCarthy raised the cup, and he was just, he, he was looked like a lad that was going to explode with, with happiness, and, um, and it's kind of funny when you when you fall you're you're covering a dominant team obviously you want to see a new team coming along but then when the dominant team is taken down you love to see them getting another kick it's like kind of the Roger Roger Federer's tennis career you love seeing him when he was on top but then you love seeing Adal coming along you love seeing Murray coming along and then you love seeing Federer getting a kick towards the end of his career and I think that will bring the dubs and particularly those uh, old stagers. Yeah, I think that will have given them as much satisfaction yesterday as anything they've achieved in their career. And there's so much history on the line yesterday and they, they managed to get over the line in fairly dramatic circumstances, it has to be said. Yeah, Jack McCaffrey going nuts as the title has been lifted. It was brilliant to watch. That childlike enthusiasm. And for Dean Rock, he was saying that uh, if Dublin didn't get over the line, he has a wedding next week. So it kind of had to go over. And he said it might he, be his no, last. His wedding, his wedding is two weeks. His stag is next week. They're going to Marbella on Thursday. So, like, the next two weeks is going to be absolute madness for them. And, like, I'm just thinking now, is, is there any other player that has, in an All-Ireland final, hit the last score? And I know this was an insurance score quite different to the, the winning score that time with the GPS final. But there can't be too many lads that have hit the winning scores or, or thereabouts in two finals. Yeah, and just on that as well, that could be his last score. There aren't too many lads that have kicked the last score in the All-Ireland Final and then retired. And as Davey Burke said on the show, uh, and Poacher and Vardy last week, there aren't too many fellas potentially that have won Footballer of the Year and then retired. And that's a distinct possibility for James McCarthy. Even though, I'd say yes, like it's mad. It's kind of mad in a way that the Dubs got over the line when thinking like two of their probably five most important players were so off colour yesterday. Like McCarthy was like it was an error strewn display, really like not typical of him at all. And and Con just wasn't on his game yesterday for whatever reason. And they still managed to get over line. Mannion stepped up, thought he was brilliant to, he thought he was brilliant throughout, probably their most consistent player throughout. And they got a massive uh they got a massive bounce from the bench. Like McCaffrey was fouled every time he got the ball nearly. They were just and you mentioned about that kind of the bit of madness in him or the bit of kind of uh, the child in them or whatever but that bit of madness helped to turn the game in Dublin's favour big time yesterday because every time he got the ball it's like he's not playing not that he's not playing to a game plan but he's just he's doing his own thing he's breaking lines he's doing things maybe that, that just some other players are unable to do and he definitely helped turn the tide big time yesterday Yeah like towards the latter end of the game Dublin had five of the last six chances so it's no surprise really that they got over the line and like I thought Michael Fitzsimons and people say I'm a little bit biased because obviously, you know, I've known him through Kula for many, many years. But like, what a performance from him. Not because Clifford didn't get chances. Like we were talking last week before the game and I remember chatting to Darren O'Sullivan and we had that live show with the likes of Tomas Fashe and Michael Darren McCauley and Colin O'Rourke the other day. And we're like, the notion that if you keep a lad to five points from play, you've actually done quite well. So Clifford got, I think it was one point, two points from play actually. And I know he missed several ones. 
But the amount of pressure that Fitzsimons put on, I'd say at times when he did actually get clear, like at, you can sometimes feel like you're under pressure. You're so used to being under pressure in a match that maybe sometimes you're spooked even when you're not under pressure and you rush a shot. So, look, maybe I'm giving Fitzsimons too much credit, but I thought he was brilliant. There were definitely one or two shots where the pressure he had applied was huge. Now, there was a couple, from Clifford's point of view, where I think he'll be a small bit haunted by that final, if, if I'm honest, in those closing few minutes, because he had probably the chances to draw it or potentially win it for Kerry, and it was just very strange. It's probably the first time he's had a real off day in a Kerry jersey, and it probably will haunt him for a while, but it will probably also drive him to even higher standards, I would say, over the coming years, and he'd be wanting to kind of set the record straight but from Fitzsimons point of view I just thought he, he applied a hell of a lot of pressure and it was just it was, yeah there was a couple of scores that you'd expect Clifford to put over but there was a couple of ones where that were lower percentage shots basically due to the, the pressure that Fitzsimons was putting on there was one under the Hogan uh, in the second half where he just got right in him and his hands in around his face not like gouging around like that he just had his hands he was blurred like just getting in the way of the goals getting in the way of his line of sight um and like if you'd if you'd said that Clifford would be kept to two points before the game started from play, you would have taken her hand off for that. Now other lads came back. Lee Gannon came back and got a brilliant uh, turnover on him. Merchant got did something similar in the first half as well. It wasn't just one on one the whole time, but when it was one on one, I thought the Simons was brilliant. Um, and the fact that like if it, like if, if you talk to you know a lot of you know aficionados in Dublin football, you know ten or fifteen years ago. And you said to them now that Michael Fitzsimons will have nine All-Ireland football titles and will end up as, you know, one of the best of his generation. They probably would have laughed at you, realistically. Because I'd say Pat Gilroy took a punt on him and he took a punt on a few kind of ungainly type players like Sir Michael Darren McCauley. And look, look how it's paid off in spades. And even talked about Cooks and Emmanuel and McCaffrey, McCaffrey coming back, but even Gilroy coming back as well and his embrace with, with Desi Farrell after. They pulled out all the stops for this yesterday. They really, really did. And Michael Dara on Thursday night just said, there's just something, when the game is in the melting pot, I just have full belief that these lads will grind it out. And when the game was there to be won, they really did grind it out. I think it was 7-2 in the closing stages. And he just had that feeling in the last five or ten Dublin were playing all the football. Dublin were creating all the chances, and it was kind of theirs to lose in the closing minutes. And they closed it out. Uh, they closed it out comprehensively enough. Yeah, Kerry missed six of their last eight chances. That gives you a fair indication of how much they maybe kind of got a little bit of white line fever, or the pressure from Dublin was a little bit too much. They got a little bit of a bounce from their bench as well. Killian Spillan, he came on and got a score. There's probably too many lads who didn't, you know, like add to what Potty Clifford was doing. He got three points and, you know, he was very good. Gainey got 1-1. One, one. Stephen O'Brien didn't really happen for him at all. Darren Moynihan had some okay things. Oh, I thought Stephen O'Brien had a good game, Shane, now I have to say. Well, I, thought, I, I, thought I thought he thought... wasn't bad now. now. Now, the only thing I'd say is I, I thought they robbed Peter to pay Paul there because I just didn't think they got enough of an impact. If you look at the impact that, that, that the Dubs got from their bench compared to what Kerry got from their bench, um, we'd say... Michal Burns, the, the two Spillans, they got a bit of a, a small bit of a bounce, but Dublin won the bench, kind of, if you're rating the two benches, you'd say Dublin was probably eight or nine out of ten, you'd probably say Kerry was a six out of ten, so I actually thought Stephen O'Brien was good, but I thought they robbed Peter to pay Paul, and I didn't think they had a real game changer potentially, and O'Brien, as we saw in the semi-final, is a game changer off the bench. In the first half, like, the first half was really dour, there was 17 scoring chances from play and just six scores. We could blame the weather and all that, but, um, Geez, I thought that sucked any momentum out of the first half just because you wanted the crowd to get into it, lift it, but it kind of sucked a lot out of it. And I don't know, I I know that the ending was tense and all that kind of stuff, but I don't know, it just wasn't my final. The same as 2015, that was in the rain, it was 12 points to nine, and I thought that was a bit dour. Did, were you excited by this game? Uh, I was excited in the second half because there was so much at play and it was very tense. There was at stages in the first half where when the ball was being played laterally, they actually thought the crowd were going to boo, genuinely, um, because there was very little going on. And I don't know if there's ever been boos during an All-Ireland final of any of any description. Like, But it could have been like that. It was, what was it, 1-4 to, to 6 at the break. It was 5 points to 4, I think, after half an hour. It was, there's no point in any different. It, it was dour enough in the first half. I think any game that's tight is going to have it's a fair bit of drama. There's a happy man this morning, Jar Brennan. Happy man today, the Jacks are back. How are you? The Jacks are back. 
I was reading your piece in the Independent this morning. Fair play to you. I was, I was reading your player ratings. There, uh, I tell you something. It's gas. They're the one thing the players will go to, and yeah. people will always take offense. Did you always <laughs> take offense from them? Uh, <laughs> if I had a poor game, I tend not to look at them at all. <laughs> if I played well, I might, I might, I might be uh, uh, attempted to throw in the eye honestly. Yeah, but um, it's uh, the last we look at them. Are, uh, you can be sure about that, you know. Uh, Jerry, what what was it like for you watching that match yesterday? Was it was it just tense throughout? Well, I just kind of caught what Michael was saying as I came in there. Um, I thought it was a poor kind of first half, uh, uh, poor quality game, really. That third quarter staple was uh, probably the best bit of football we've seen from both sides. It looked like it was going to kind of spark into life, and then it fell short again. But it was like nearly a pretty pre-season game at times. You could hear the players calling each other's names in the pitch. Um, I was in the upper Hogan and around the halfway line. I'm saying to the wife, it's gas, you can actually hear the calls uh, coming in. Whereas I remember uh, in preparation for the all Ireland final in 2011, Pat Gilroy had us doing A-B games and you weren't allowed to talk to anyone beside you. You had to play the match in silence just to communicate with your eyes and your hands, which uh, was mad. Uh, uh, but, but but yesterday, yeah, it was uh, a bit of a damn scrib of a game, but but obviously given what, what was at stake, an all Ireland final medal, um, that's really what added to the occasion, I thought, you know. Yeah, how sweet is it to be Kerry in a final? Well, obviously, I, I well, anyone listening, I, I played with St. Vincent, so Kevin Heffernan with St. Vincent's, Mickey Whelan, Pat Gilroy, Tony Hanahoe, uh, Gail Driscoll, um, a lot of greats, Jimmy Keaveney, and we were always told by those lads, in, in particular, when I started off uh, coming to our senior uh, with the club. Uh, Tony Han, not so, sorry, not so much Tony, sorry, Kevin Heffern and Lord Reston was still knocking around. And Kevin used to say, It's not really an All Ireland unless you be Kerry along the way. And that goes back to that rivalry that uh, obviously started in the 70s when Kevin was manager. And uh, I'd say it's probably something similar for Kerry as well that uh, uh, it's not as sweet unless you take out of Dublin along the way. So, so if you just take it on its mirrors, that it's the two best footballing counties, uh, traditionally speaking, uh, have haven't reached the final. Um, to kind of take the scalp on one of them is is is, uh, is incredible. It's icing on the cake. Mm. Wow. What was it like, Jared? What was it like when the final whistle blew? Yesterday, you 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 you, you could see. Um, I I was delighted, firstly for for Desi Farrell and Darren Daly. So so Darren is probably going. Uh, Darren is probably going a bit under the radar. So Darren Butsy, as we call him. He has been involved with Dublin since probably I started, uh, 2006-07. He, he was in and out of teams, uh, but always a constant uh, player in the first 2022. And he's won four or five all Ireland himself, Michael, and he went straight back in to the setup. And his name doesn't get mentioned too much, but he's obviously putting in, like everyone else in the backroom team, a massive shift. So I was watching him and Desi embrace and the jump with such joy because... Uh, Darren is quite, you know, emotionally aware, like a lot of good managers and coaches are, you know, not to become totally engrossed in what's happening in front of you to allow you to make decisions. And then Desi is a, a, another version of, of, of Jim Gavin, albeit his own man too, and that he doesn't get overly excited. So to watch those two boys embrace Michael, I thought that was lovely. Um, knowing Jack McCarthy then, and obviously Stephen Cluxon and Paul Mannion, the three lads going back in, um, I was delighted to see them uh, embrace and obviously Michael Simons, a good few of the guys played with uh, UCD uh, played Sigerson that there so good relationship with the lads so it was great to see them uh, celebrate together and I think particularly you heard James McCarthy emotional at times Michael that the stick that Desi and the management were taking the previous two years that you know this Dublin team and, and look at stick maybe isn't the right word but from a journalist's point of view, the analysis would suggest that this Dublin team are playing without any particular identity. Their style of football is quite boring. They have defenders shooting from everywhere, which was uh, at odds to how we used to be when when when, uh, when Jim uh, would have taken over. But now, having won this year, I know Desi won the sixth in a row, but there was probably a hangover, you could say, uh, from Jim's time. But to then, you know, fall down to Division Two. And, and kind of stutter through the Division Two League uh, Leinster uh, campaign 
and then one or two group games, they weren't wonderful either, but then to really show up and account it and the knockout stages and then to, to get the job done. Very scrappy yesterday, but that bit of experience, they just got the job done. Mm, and the Stephen Cluxton decision, the U-turn to bring him back, that really paid off, uh, Ger. Yeah, like uh, people were, were, were comparing, say, last year's one-point loss, they uh, to Kerry. Uh, uh, they were analysing it with, say, if Calm was playing, uh, uh, but he wasn't. If Calm was playing last year, he would have cancelled out Clifford's points and Dublin would have won. But last year, there was no Con, there was no Stephen, there was no Paul Mannion, there was no Jack McCaffrey. This year, there's a Con. Albeit uh, 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 he worked hard uh, defensively, uh, uh, a, bit, a, bit, a bit loose in his possession. Um, but then you add Paul Mannion to it, he kicked five points. Stephen Cluxton kicked two points. Jack came in, became uh, much more direct uh, as an attack, which caused problems for Kerry. He just looked the man in the eyes and, and, and tried to go past him, created overlaps, drew a few frees. So it was a uh, Hugely uh, um, influential, all four lads uh, being available, but in particular Stephen, Jack and, uh, and Paul coming back into the fold. Mm. Um, Ger, I'm just going to kick you out for a second if you can click back in. I think there's a small little crackle on that, so we'll have you back in in a second there if you can click no. in. Um, so, yeah, my, uh, just taking up that point there, like, do you agree in terms of, like, like, or what do you think in terms of the Cluxton? Do you think he was of the four lads that Ger talked about coming back in? Was he singly the most decisive player? Oh, um, it's funny, delivered his best on the biggest occasion. I don't think he scored a free, Shane, since 2014. Yeah, 14, and he yeah. Kicked, and he kicked frees in all Ireland final yesterday. And it was like, I know it's easy to say it when they sail over, but it's like there was no element of doubt. He kicked the first one, I just watched it back last night. It had barely left his boot and he was gone down the other end of the field. It was straight over the black spot. And like, sure, those two frees were, were crucial at the end. Mannion obviously was able to kick two in either half. And the free he kicked, Shane, in the 52nd minute when Jack McCaffrey had made a dart taking a shot but he was pulled back Mannion kicked a free uh, off his left under the Cusick the lower Cusick there it was a brilliant free and they were under pressure at the time I think they were yeah they were three down at the time he kicked some massive massive scores yesterday and when when Con was quiet and even when McCarthy was quiet they needed someone like Mannion to step up and just on it as well and I think he's he, he doesn't seem to be in the football of the year conversation at the minute and I'm not sure why but I thought Brian Fenton was brilliant again yesterday Um, and I thought he he moved into defensive areas that Jack Barry probably didn't want to be in. He won a lot of even dirty ball in around his own 21. He, I remember I remember him winning a throw-in, that kind of controversial throw-in where it looked like uh, David Clifford took a bit of a powder at one stage, uh, went to the ground. Mick Fitz, who, who is so honest, and I think he went into the umpire and said whatever. And then all of a sudden, the decision was overturned. It wasn't a free-in. And I think if that was any other player, um, for example, if that had been John Small, I don't know if he would have got the benefit of it out, but Mick Fitz definitely got the benefit of it out. Fenton tapped down the throw-in, and about 30 seconds later, uh, I forget who put the ball over the bar, but that had another massive Mannion. play. He kicked a lov- yeah, Mannion, he kicked a lovely point then, Fenton at the end. Uh, Jerry, you might, you obviously... Um, might have seen the start of Brian Fenton um, just before you kind of stepped out, but I've never seen anything like a lad. He never, ever, ever shoots off balance. He, he's always in the perfect position when he's shooting, and I thought he came up with some huge scores yesterday. I think he's right in the conversation for Footballer of the Year, I have to say. Yeah, yeah he, he, he's, he's extremely consistent, uh, Michael. When, when he shoots, it's the right decision. Uh, and he has that ability to kind of swerve around his marker, get in behind them and cut back onto the right foot, you know. And even if you watch him striking the ball as well, he's not he's not trying to bust the thing. He's just nearly passing the ball over the bar. Um, he nearly r- reminds you of a, of a TJ Reader after taking freeze, 45 degree angles, uh, uh, playing the percentages and... Uh, uh, Brian Fenton hits the ball the same way, but he's just a very calm, composed individual. Even uh, at times, I thought the first half, I'll be he kicked one nice point. And uh, the first half, I thought Jack Barry was kind of nullifying him uh, uh, particularly well. And then the second half, uh, Brian really came into it, picked up a lot of possession, dictated the play, uh, scored the second point, uh, won a throw up on the uh, on R21 um late in the second half as well so he became hugely influential but uh he's just a guy that's not um overawed by 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 the occasion and he's uh he has a lot to be fair to him and he's a, he's a lovely bloke too 
Mm. Um, just to, we were talking about the job that Mikey Fitzsimons did on, on Clifford, and Clifford had a few chances and missed him and all that, but what did you make of, as a defender yourself, uh, Fitzsimons' performance? Yeah, I, I thought Fitzy did, did particularly well, Sapo. His, again, in the, in the lead up to it, a couple of questions uh, or, or other shows, I, I was on speaking uh, um, about Fitzy in that matchup. Fitz is another guy that doesn't panic. He he knows that he's marking a, a, a corner forward, a full forward, whether it's a David Clifford or somebody else, and that by their nature, they're going to get a couple of scores off you. So if you can kind of come out on top, you know, if there's 15 balls coming into him, if you come in eight balls, um, if you don't win them all, can you force him back into the cover, which he obviously did quite well. Um, he wasn't really turned or exposed uh, on, on too many occasions. I think once he slipped in the first half, uh, I think Lee Gannon got in, Owen Merchant then, they were in there for the cover, for the goal. Uh, uh, Paul Gini's uh, goal, again, I think he still had uh, Clifford kind of boxed off. Brian Howard was coming over to support him. Wonderful piece of skill from Clifford and moving from Paul Gainey and great composure from him to, 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 to put the ball into the net. But uh, but overall, on Fitzy, uh, very, very composed. A lot of the work he does is off the ball staple. And quite often, the, the, the highlights reels, as again, as a, as a defender and I'm uh, in the defenders uh, union here. And uh, the amount of runs that Fitzy would have covered just from watching uh, the game live, when a Kerry man was looking up, the odd time he had a bit of space, Fitzy was covering off the angles as best as he could. So Clifford was making two or three, sometimes four runs. And it could have been the fifth run that maybe Clifford would have got and he would have been in a less dangerous uh, position or the ball might not uh, have come in as quick. But the amount of work that uh, Mick does off the ball is is incredible, you know? Mm, Michael? Yeah, did, did, uh, just, did, did Kerry miss a bit of a trick, John, here? Like, Kerry were in a brilliant position halfway through the second half. Um, maybe Paddy Small's goal, a bit of a deflection, kind of, that brought them back into the game. But Kerry were back up I think they responded with the next three points that they after the goal. They did, yeah. Like mm. this will haunt them a bit as a team as well. Like that, the, they were in, they had themselves in a winning position and they just never kicked on. I think once Paulie Clifford put the three up in the fifty-first minute, I don't think they scored for fifteen minutes thereafter. Like they had themselves in a really, really good position and just never really kicked on. Yeah, and and even watching it um, in the stadium, you know, there was a sense there from myself and other Dublin supporters. Like, we didn't see where the momentum shift was going to occur because Kerry they went three points up. I fully agree with you. The goal, Paddy got it on his right foot. It was deflected in. He's a left footer. He's known for cutting in and, and, and barely shoots on the right. But uh, I'm, I'm sure the lads are slagging him about that uh, last night and today. But um, when Kerry came up to Paddy Clifford, maybe Sean O'Shea scored um, either side of Paddy Clifford's points. Um, Kerry were three points up again and that goal was nullified and then I was sitting there and I was beginning to become a bit worried Dublin had played a lot of our cards uh, Jack was on uh, Sean McMahon uh, you can see he was getting ready to come on for Brian Howard was fatiguing Key Murphy come on for Owen Morton Morton was fatiguing it kind of like for like swaps and both of those lads did really well by the way Sean McMahon and uh, Key Murphy how hard they showed for for uh, Pluckos kickouts and there were options in the middle the whole time, which gave us a lot of go forward. But Kerry definitely missed the trick. They didn't see the game out. They they had opportunities to to, to to probably slow it down to keep possession to make Dublin work a bit harder for it. They could have used Shane Roy maybe a bit better in the, in their goal to to, to, to to hold possession. It is a bit riskier when the team squeezes uh, on you, Michael. But Ultimately, they probably had. I don't know what the the, the, the the shot to score ratio was for both both teams. You I haven't looked at that. You might have it there, but I would say Dublin had the same amount of shots as Kerry had, and 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 just Dublin slightly like like it, like it's fine margins. It really is fine margins, you know. And late on, or sorry, after the game, what sort of celebration did you have? Did you meet up with some of the the other former players? I know you said you were there with the with the family. Yeah. You're yeah, a lot fresher today than I expected you to be. I'll tell you that. I, I, I thought, we went up on the Saturday night, Michael, and uh, myself and the wife were, were down with the in-laws. I'm in Ashley Capaquin here now at the moment. Uh, um, Ashley's parents uh, took the kids before kids, Michael, so they took the kids for, for the Saturday night and we enjoyed Sunday. So I had a good few points now before and after the game and then Ashley drove us home. So uh, 
Uh, I'm on duty today, so there's a, a no getting away. But no, we went back over. Keen O'Sullivan was over there. Um, uh, good chat with Jack O'Shea from Kerry. He was uh, um, uh, looking back and speaking about fond memories and battles with uh, uh, Brian Mullins, who's no longer with us. Lord address him. Mark O'Shea was there. Great chat with him. Uh, we were just speaking, probably similar to what the content is here, that opportunities were there for Kerry to, you know, go and win it, go close it out. But Dublin's just experienced uh, uh, that bit more composure and then the quality coming, coming, in, coming in off the line. For Dublin is really just just what got us over the line in the end. But uh, and to, to give credit, I don't know whether David Goff has come up in the conversation. Uh, uh, Dublin and Kerry fans alike, and talking to Jack and Mark and and, and Keane, we would have all felt that David Goff had a had a very good game. Um, overall, he tried to let the game flow. A couple of decisions here and there. Maybe James got lucky with. One or two maybe yellow cards that, that could have come his way. But you don't say. Yeah, James. But that that's happens. Look, he's going for his ninth all Ireland. James is, is one of the nicest fellas ever off the pitch, and 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 David would know that. And uh, but look, it's, it's an all Ireland final. The juice were flowing. James is probably a bit nervy. I have to say, you now watching him uh, during the game, it wasn't one of his uh, his best games in possession. Uh, but but overall, that leadership he obviously showed. He kept fighting away, you know. Mm. Just on Goff, he, Goff refed it. Goff refed it like an All Ireland final. I think he yeah. was a bit looser, maybe than a normal game. Like McCarthy probably should have had a yellow early enough. And when mm. the second, the big tackle came in the second half, he probably should have been on a yellow. But I think it was refereed. Listen, I I think it should be refereed a bit looser for an All Ireland final. To be honest with you, and I think that's the way it was. And I don't um, you know what Goff was booed after. I, I, I you know I didn't see any big yeah. call or big decision or anything like that that he got wrong. Yeah, but he, he 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 was booed by all the Dublin fans for his uh, um for the well I think for the me Dublin rivalry that was my taking it because all the Kerry supporters had gone at that stage, and 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 that's what it was is when he said he was from Slain, uh, Larry McCarthy said it was, <clears throat> and everyone boo, but I thought it was it was kind of done in jest, and you could see the, the camera going on to Goff. Maybe so, yeah. He was he was he was he was, he, he was laughing away, but. Uh, no, look, he's he's one of the best referees out there. The one thing about Goff, and I would have played um, a good few games with him, and David Kodrick, another mead man who they need to have a look at that age rule. It's it's uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, he's he, he's out of contention for refereeing for county now because I think he's 50, and uh, despite how good he is, and a couple of the hurling refs too. But um, those kind of refs, the likes of Goff and Kodrick, Pat McEnany in the past, those fellas would talk to you on the pitch. And if you're acting the goat, they be, you know, they'd be saying to you, I'm watching you, Jer, I'm watching you, stay for you know, see what you're doing. And you're having a bit of crack with them. And then you'd be getting booked and they'd be saying, listen, that's your second or third one. What do you want me to do? You know, and you'd be fair enough, ref, okay. So there's a healthy dialogue. Whereas God helps someone do the refs, they're, they're, they're just not, uh, um, some of them, well, one or two of them, we've all met over the years through badness, but generally speaking, uh, uh, most refs just probably lack that bit of uh, emotional in- intelligence and maturity. Uh, to be able to actually engage respectfully with players, you know, yeah, even the last three, Dean, even Dean Rock's last three, you could see Goff like he probably didn't want to give that free in front of the uh, the hill end, but obviously it was to uh, put us two up. That was it done then, but it was a high tackle, and you could see him saying, "Listen, it's a high tackle." Goff's hands were out, like, "What do you want me to do?" You know, mm-hmm. but uh, no, I thought, I thought I thought himself and the officials had a great game, so. Yeah, Colin Baskell's had a great year overall. Semi-final didn't go his way, but I'm just going through it here, and he scored a couple of points. He won the turnover on Gavin White to set up the goal. He set up Paul Mannion's uh, score in the 74th minute. He won the free for the last one for Rock in the 76th mm. minute. So he was very decisive towards the end. He's very good, and well, he set up that 74th minute for uh, score for Paul Mannion. He should have passed it before that. There's a goal chance on, and he went Ooh. greedy. He took a shot on the left foot. <laughs> but, but, but I, I'm sure the lads will tell him that too. But he, 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 he uh, delighted for Colin. He, he has been knocking around for a good few years. Uh, Barry Bowden to the end. His man, he would have gone to UCD too. He is, um, somewhat he can be somewhat of an introvert type character, different to his brother, but extremely explosive. And trying to find that bit of consistency, I think, was. One of Colin's big challenges, and we've seen he really performed in the quarterfinal, man marked really well in the semis against Monaghan. 
Cormac Costello really stood up in the in, in the semi final. Man marked really well against Thomas Sullivan uh, yesterday. Um, then in the second half, given uh, Basquale's uh, uh, diamondism and how direct he is, he's a version of Jack McCarthy in some ways, and he's quite elusive the way he runs. He's nearly running in in in, in kind of bends. Um, he's going to cause you problems. He, he he's going to take guys on. Uh, he's going to create overlaps. He's going to run at the shoulder. He's going to draw freeze. He's going to get torn over on occasion. But overall, his contributions, as you uh, uh, gave their staple, were, were were incredible. You know, his work right off the ball was fabulous, uh, to be fair to him too, you know. I, I think he ended up with 5.17 from play throughout the championship. Like, and yeah. then we talk we talk about all the players that came back, but this is probably his third coming with, uh, with Dublin yeah. nearly. And like, they need Desi probably needed a player like that to step up. And even the last couple of years, the bits of experience he got into, like to, with, say, Key Murphy, um, into... Mm. You know, Ross McGarry, these guys, they were all able to come in. Lads were able to come in and contribute. I think, it, like, they wouldn't have probably been able to do that two years ago. And that's probably been the work in progress that it's been. All the games that these guys played in the league um, this year, last year, championship games they played, it all kind of paid fruits in those last couple of minutes. But they needed someone like Colin Pascal to step up. And uh, yeah, he's a, he's a certain all star anyway for me. And he's, he's probably not a million miles away from the Footballer of the Year conversation. That conversation is going to be fascinating as well because mm-hmm. um, it seems like, uh, like James McCarthy had to me, he's an unbelievable footballer. We had one of his probably worst games at Dublin yesterday. And it's like, it's the, it's the career Footballer of the Year that yeah. they're looking to give him. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see, really interesting to see who the three nominees are because you could probably put, Jesus, probably five or six sides you could put in there credibly. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what way that vote goes as well. But that's that's for probably for another day. Yeah. Who's the team there? Well, uh, I think if, uh, the way you described there, Michael, if you're looking at you know, lifetime achievements and contribution to Dublin senior football, he has to be looking at James McCarthy as 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 an outfield player, Cluxton as our keeper and, and and previous leader and a leader when he came back in too, uh, massive massive influence on the squad as well. But uh, yeah, I I I think you have to give it to James overall. Uh, he had a poor game today. David Clifford had a poor uh, yesterday rather. David Clifford was 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 poor by his standards yesterday too. But you know he has to be up there as well. He he, he kind of carries um carries carry. In a lot of their games, particularly during the knockout stages, too, uh, he has to be up there. Um, but for me, James, yeah, he would probably be the standout guy overall. Um, I think he just really had the bit between the seats as the championship progressed this year, and he, he, he again fully agree with you. He, he'd a he'd a very nervy, uncharacteristically poor uh, game when he was in possession, but he was still throwing his body around. He was making hits, a uh, bit of a war of attrition that eventually breaks fellas down towards the. You know the home straight, which will obviously impact in their decision making and ability as well. So, uh, I I I certainly give it to James. Uh, but that's me with my uh, blue tint of the glasses on. You know, so just on that, sure. Will, will Will James McCarthy be back next year? Do you think? Like, if we were to say James McCarthy, Mick Fitzsimons, Dean Rock, uh, Paul Mannion, Jack McCaffrey, Stephen Cluxon, Desi Farrell, like how many of these guys do you think are going to be back next year? What do, what do you think that kind of makeup will look like next year? There's talk of Brian Fenton going away for the year. There's all sorts of talk. It could be a completely different Dublin next year. How do you see that? Who who do you think will be there? Who do you think won't be there? Well, I I, I, I if you were to ask me this last week, I, I would have said a lot of the guys that you touched upon are going to finish up. Uh, now I was listening to uh, uh, a podcast during the week. Mossy Quinn, uh, my club mate, and Gooch Cooper were on, and 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 that question came up, and 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 the top Mossy put it well. He says, given the split season that we have now, um, lads will go back to their clubs in the next week. The Dublin Club Football Championship starts I think, in two weeks' time, and they tip away with the club. But it's going to be another nearly five to six months, Michael, until the next inter-county game. Whereas the previous uh, fixture scheduling meant that uh, you had very little break, played with the club and straight back into the county. So what I'm getting at, I agree with Mossy Quinn, is that that gap allows players to actually decompress, uh, go back, play with the clubs, however well they do uh, um, in those county championships, take a bit of time off, relax over the winter, mind the bodies, and then mentally and physically, you know, who knows what could happen. I think if a Desi goes to the lads and says, listen, if you look at the four best teams this year, semi-finalists, you know, Derry, Monaghan, 
uh, Dublin and Kerry. You know, for me, if we have all those same players available next year, for me, Kerry are the only team that could probably stop Dublin, albeit Derry uh, uh, are getting closer the whole time. They probably missed the trick too in that semi final, so many chances that they didn't convert. But uh, so that could be the selling point to you go for 10 All Ireland's. But uh, so I don't know. So that so that space might allow lads an opportunity to, to, to reflect. Uh, Dean is probably, regardless of what some of the other lads do, Dean maybe. Uh, he he was usually influential. He scored one one or one. He scored one one the semi final coming in. He's had to contribute another point there the last day. Um, will he be content with just coming in as a bit part player? That's hard to do. It takes a lot of humility to do that. You might do it for a season, maybe two seasons, but uh, when you're used to starting, it can be difficult to to to, to uh, uh, pick and splinters out of your backside for the for the large part of your uh, season sitting on the bench. And and overall, Jared, did you enjoy this season? And another question on top of that, as you know, you're seeing football up and down the country, yeah. being involved in GA and UCD. Are there more good footballers coming in Dublin, or are we coming towards the end of Dublin dominance? I would say we're probably coming towards the end of of, of Dublin dominance, uh, or the prolific players of Jack McCarthy and Paul Mannion, Kirill Kilkenny. I, I I probably haven't seen that quality of a, a freakish player um, in the underage ranks just yet but certainly within Dublin the structures that are there are, are, are strong as ever you've usually committed volunteers and clubs and uh, involved with de- development squads and, and the county boards obviously under John Costello's leadership he's obviously stepping away and he put in Trojan work too along with uh, uh, numerous uh County board executives over, I think maybe thirty years or forty years, nearly that John was involved. So, uh, so the structure there, but the quality uh, probably isn't the same. In terms of the championship overall, I thought it was a poor championship. Um, I thought there were so many meaningless games. I thought there were so many games rushed into such a short amount of period that we have to extend it out. Uh, watching the hurling final last week. What a wonderful game. You're, you're celebrating uh, an incredible hurling team in Limerick and you're trying to read a few bits in the paper on the Monday and tune into a few podcasts in the car. And then next thing you know, Monday evening, Tuesday morning, we're talking about the football final. And to actually digest and, and, and enjoy the games that were viewed uh, uh, um, and to discuss them and have the crack up a club train and everything else. And also to give the players who are playing an extra week of recovery um, I think that's something that the GA probably needs to look at. The provincial championships are dead dodo uh, in football, and the Ulster Championship is competitive, and and it always will be. In fairness to to the Ulster Council, they've managed to get that right. Uh, but the other three provinces are, are particularly poor. Um, the pre-season competitions, again, I don't see their purpose anymore. I think we're just asking too much for players. And I think a more direct link between the, the league and what championship you play in, whether it's Sam Maguire or Talchin Cup, I think that would be the obvious route to go, where you put the provinces uh, before that as your precursor. But I, I don't know if the... And and I don't like the term dinosaurs that sometimes people would use to, 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 to describe some of the older gentlemen and, and, of course, women now who are heavily involved at administrative level uh, uh, at provincial councils because they've put their heart and soul and blood and sweat into it. And the GEA have always compared it to the to the, to the the Catholic shirt for me, right, to my loves. But they're very slow moving. They have a lot of positives, but Jeannie Mac uh, uh, will be pulling your hair out sometimes. But uh, uh, so, yeah, so the league, problems is before the league, get rid of the pre-season competitions, play your provincial championship into the league, and then into the championship uh, proper. Okay, well, look, brilliant stuff, Jer. Enjoy Kappa Quinn down there, and we'll chat again soon. Cheers, lads. See you, Michael. See Cheers. you, Sabo. Cheers, Jer. God bless, lads. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, great to have Jer on there. Delighted to say we're now joined by Tim Moynihan of Radio Kerry. Tim, you obviously not the, the brightest looking today. It was a tough day for you yesterday. Can we get the Kerry side of things? Yeah. Um, good morning, or good afternoon, now, Shane. I don't know if it's morning or afternoon we have, lads. Uh, look, I suppose from a, a bit of supporter point of view and likewise, uh, I suppose that team management stroke players today, you don't want to be at the end of an All-Ireland defeat. Uh, you know, well, that's what it's like in the county, uh, why it's like that. Um, and you go back and you try to go back and see the ifs and the buts of, of yesterday. But, you know, when you look back at it, you'd say that um, 
Dublin are a major team, Shane. Uh, I think it's part of, you know, that you, you learn a lot when you win eight All-Irelands. Uh, the players feed in, I suppose, what Jim Gavin did in the past, likewise, Desi Farrell. And, and yesterday, you know, we, it's easy to sit in hindsight now, but they're like, bringing back Pat Gilroy, the boys looking for, they had plenty of motivation to win this one yesterday. And uh, I just, even I was thinking of it coming down the car, you know, that do you see that warm-up? I don't know if you've seen the clip where, uh, it was a Carmel Costello and Fitzsimons. Fitzsimons. They they went to war before the game had started, and they took that war into the Kerry game, Kerry game. And I, I suppose to be fair to David Goffin, look, I know somebody we can be blinkered at times and we can go after the refs, but to be fair, I think he did a brilliant job. But there was five bookable offenses for James McCarthy. I'm not using that as a, all. I'm saying is you test the referee. You can do it the club game as well. You know, the first 10, 15 minutes of the game, where can I go with a ref? And sometimes you might have to go on that white line, go past that white line. And today, if James McCarthy was playing with Kerry, we'd say he's like Paul Gavin. He was a war, a war hero. So, you know, there's different aspects. You look at the game yesterday. But look, the feeling down here today, maybe you could say it's one that got away. Maybe if, if, if uh, David Clifford had put that score up, uh, you know, to level matters, who knows what happened. But it's not a case of pinpointing those margins. Uh, we've got to respect uh, where the game has gone, and I, I, I don't think Shane, any of the two count, any other county wouldn't stay with either Kerry or Dublin yesterday. They've just lifted it uh, to another level, and uh, you know you learn from those defeats. And maybe look, we have to go for a, hopefully a few players uh, around the county. Our county championship is coming up as well, so uh, you know. But having said that, yes, <laughs> if you're asking me how did I feel in the route of my way. Uh, I feel sick in the stomach this morning. <laughs> yeah, it, it's coming across, Tim, and I don't blame you either. But I, I was just going through the stats there. From the 58 minute on, after Dublin had scored three in a row to level it, Kerry missed six of their eight final chances. And obviously Dublin, you know, they, they knocked over that two more. Was there any sort of element of white line fever across the board? And I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, singling out David Clifford because there were other lads who missed chances as well. And I think you queued it up nicely there. Look, I suppose coming into this game, uh, David Clifford, he was no different to yourself or anyone in the media, the papers, here down when we were doing the build up on Radio Kerry, uh, every supporter, the one name they were talking about is David Clifford. And that's absolutely brilliant. Of the, To me, he's one of the best footballers of all time, if not the best. But at the same token, in a day like this where you don't, I suppose the one thing, and we learn it down here in club games, you don't let the best player in the opposition beat you. And that was the first job that Dublin did yesterday. Either start from a possession, crowd him out of it. So then it's a chance for other players to step up to the breach. And I suppose we've pride ourselves in carry over in all Ireland. We did win. We've shooters. At the minute, it only seems if we want shooter. And that's that's been brutally honest. Where we have a system where our half forward line track back, work very hard, but you have to get scores from that half forward line as well when they go into pockets. And that's not happening for Kerry at the moment. And if I, I suppose yesterday. We tied up David Clifford, uh, or they tied up David Clifford, and we were in serious trouble. So, uh, and the balance of play, we pro- as I said, you need uh, you need scoring forwards. Dublin had scoring forwards yesterday, and for some reason, we didn't have. Mm, and like, do you think there's anything more that Jack O'Connor could have done in terms of like, did he get the most out of his team yesterday? Yeah, I think he got most of the fellas playing inside the white line. But you know, everything is systematic nowadays, Shane. Uh, you know, you measure where you are in the game after 15 minutes and see if there's any change, be it a black card, be it anything, you have to change the goalposts. I think, look, everybody will probably question now because the game is over, why do we start with uh, Stephen O'Brien? Now, Stephen O'Brien, he was brilliant. He probably played himself on. We're not privy to what went on in training. Uh, should he brought him on as an impact player? And we saw Killian Spillane kicking that score. So, you know, the, the bench is so, so... Uh, imparted now. Dublin had that bench and just even for a shout coming from the crowd to lift the crowd when a player comes on. We saw it for with Jack McCaffrey. We heard the noise all over the stadium. And that can get inside players' minds, especially the, the Kerry players' minds as well. And I know that Kerry, probably Jack O'Connor, well, they had a plan in place if Jack McCaffrey came on. But the detail now, you know, as Ambrose O'Donovan, my co commentator said, a GPS doesn't kick the ball over the bar. But at the same token now, it's so measured, it's so... It, to be in players' head, you know that what's going to happen in the 10th minute, the 11th minute. That's that's why I say that the, the two teams yesterday, Shane, are far, far uh, removed from the teams underneath. In this, it, it, they were just they're just at that level. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think I don't think Jack O'Connor could have done anything else yesterday. 
uh, you know, when those players inside the white lines, uh, they take responsibility. So, look, there's no blame game here this morning in the kingdom, to be fair. You, we're not blaming the ref. Uh, we're, we're probably, it, we probably announced, yes, where we are as well. And uh, look, we'll have brighter days ahead, I'm sure. Uh, because the average age of this team, uh, 26, 27, maybe if you take the, the Paul Gaines and, 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 and the Paul Murphys out of this and the Stephen O'Brien, and, uh, you know, that's the challenge line ahead, the challenge to get up. But it must be desperate for a player to wake up in the, the hotel room this morning You're after lo- losing an All-Ireland final. And the only thing is in your mind, we have to get up and go again. You know, that's tough. Yeah, and do, do you see any of those players that you've just mentioned, Stephen O'Brien, Paul Gainey and Paul Murphy, do you, see, do you see them all being back next year or...? Maybe uh, one or two of them decide to step away. Yeah, first of all, I suppose it kind of has parallels with what I'm saying, Shane, that um, there's so many demands in a player nowadays that, you know, you have to sacrifice your family. You have to sacrifice any sort of social lifestyle. Uh, it's a big take. And a lot of these, like if, uh, Paul Gainey is a young family. Likewise, uh, Stephen O'Brien, uh, or not Stephen O'Brien, uh, guys that are married in the last couple of years they have families and that's that's very difficult uh if you know you know you've to sacrifice time and when you have a young family and you have work work commitments that's why we lost david morn he's a young family uh you know and he's a high a big big career in the accountancy side of things so the demands of players nowadays sheen uh it, you know it's a huge sacrifice <laughs> and I, i'm afraid to say it's probably a single man's game and uh, because the commitment you have to put your life and, and hold i could see one or two walk away the only thing I would say, and I'm not announcing it here today on, on, on your podcast, is that I, there's a strong possibility that Mark O'Connor is coming back. That's the rumour mill, has it around the county. Uh, I know that uh, Geelong had to win the weekend, and if they won, you know, they'd be in the playoffs, and I don't think they're there. There's a strong possibility we could see him line out with his club, Dingle, uh, this year, and there's huge talks that he'll be on the Kerry panel in 2024. Now, uh, that's talked through the grapevine, uh, and that'd be huge, huge p- positive for Kerry. But on the same token, uh, if you ask me about yesterday and look at the game, a half forward line today in today's game, you must be workhorse, you must be able to defend, but you have to pop up with scores. If you look at yesterday, and it's amazing how the game has gone, we'd say David Clifford is going to take us over the line because he's going to get scores. Yesterday, anyone the build up the real pros that the pundits that were doing they were saying that Kerry would have to probably hit that 20 point mark yesterday to beat Dublin and as it transpired you saw what what Dublin scored we probably needed those 20 points mm. and with Dublin you have to ask questions you have to you have to take advantage of goal scoring opportunities put them on the back foot question them and uh, plant a seed of doubt and I don't think we planted any planted any seed of doubt yesterday you know did you, what was the build-up like in Kerry for this? Was it one of these things you, you sometimes hear in different counties that it's nearly out of control and it might have been claustrophobic for the players or whatever, but did you get any sense of that? Uh, you know, it, it's difficult. Like the, These players have lives. They go back to their homes in the evening. They talk to their family. They try to avoid newspaper and media. Uh, the build-up was, you know, you, you go back to 2019 when we played Dublin, we drew with them and we were beaten in the replay. It was kind of different this year. We, we were giving ourselves serious chance. We were all Ireland champions, but it was a, and a lot of, I suppose, supporters' minds as well that that point by uh, Shawnee O'Shea last year uh, in that All Ireland semi final probably will be talked about for, for years to come. That maybe if we didn't score that, Dublin had the legs in the in the second half, uh, or in, in, in extra time, if there was extra time that day. Yesterday, I thought the team that was full of running in that final 10, 12 minutes was Dublin and even the older guys. But I, I suppose you feed off the energy, the adrenaline. I, I, and I think that we're underestimating here the significance of the Dublin supporters. Even at times yesterday when Kerry got a score, come on, your boys in blue was the song. And I tell it's very. I don't care how you switch off inside those white lines. You are hearing those things. And you, you saw when, and John was decisive as well, Shane, yesterday. We conceded that goal to Dublin, uh, you know, in the second half. And you said the next two kickouts, they won them. And they have that momentum. And that happens in every Dublin game. They, again, you're on the back foot. And, uh, you know, that, that hurts as well. But you, if you, if you, I'm sure they'll go back over the next couple of weeks and carry a look at it when they're able to look at it and uh, say the chances. How would I like to be after 20 minutes of the game? Were we where we were? Like you go in and have to... We, I, I think, and I was actually inside the canteen that time with yourself. I popped over to your table. And we were looking up at the screen and it said 61% possession by Kerry. If you have that amount of possession in the first half, 
you have to take advantage. And there was a wise kick to both sides, by the way, as well. Mm. And maybe that other opportunity by Paul Ganey, you know, you're sticking two goals and it would it would question Dublin have to come out and chase the game in a big way. Straight away, they were level with us at the start of the second half. Yeah, and just in terms of like Desi Farrell, now when we, when we look at the other side of it, you got that first All-Ireland and I'm sure there's plenty of people out there just saying that was Jim, Jim, Jim Gavin's All-Ireland as well because he just took over the previous team and so on. He's going to get a lot more credit now because he's had to. He's really had to rework this team. Absolutely, and the most important thing, Shane, that he had to buy the trust of the players. You know, if you had Jim Gavin coming into the dressing room and uh, he ran it like a military operation, but I think his legacy is still with this Dublin side. And then you're trying to put on your own mark. If you look here back in the eighties, that you had uh, Mikko Dwyer, uh, one of the greatest managers of all times. You know, he was there. He he did a four in a row. Uh, we lost then the 82 to Offaly, 83, then to Cork and the most final. We came back and won three in a row, which is kind of haunting, really, because Dublin seemed to be in the same position. But any manager, the likes of the Mickey Ned O'Sullivan, Ogie Moore, the ma- managers that follow that, you would always, you know, compare to the man that came before that was successful. And I think a huge, huge credit is uh, for Desi Farrell. And do you know the good thing about a manager, uh, Shane, is that you can do it all yourself. And that's why the likes of Pat Gilroy was brought back. If you can't do a job yourself, you bring in. And with a manager nowadays at this level, you don't manage the team. You manage the management team to manage the players. And that's the big thing. And the, the buck stops with you. But it's like if you open a, a supermarket in the morning up in Tipperary, you're not going to be in the fruit and veg department and customer service. And you're going to manage people to manage that. And that's where the game, the game is a business now. It's as close to being professional as one takes. So uh, and when you when you give credit this morning, you have to give it to Desi Farrell because there was a lot of dozers in Dublin, probably within the camp. And mm-hmm. likewise, obviously, support. We can we can be ruthless supporters and critical. Uh, but today you have to give uh, the man credit. Uh, you, when you sit into a hot seat, it'd be like the late, late John Gay Borden uh, or anybody else. You have to do what they did before you, you know. Do, like being on the ground in, in Kerry and being at club football and so on and so forth, is there more talent coming? And like Mark O'Connor, if he did come back, that'd be a huge boost. But like, do you feel that there's more talent coming? Because sometimes I look at that forward line and maybe the midfield unit and like, obviously you're going for athleticism, you're going with speed. Uh, and I just don't know if there's the right blend of like someone who's able to take scores, who's a big enough man, but able to stay going all day and also quite quick. So it seems sometimes you've got too many small lads, sometimes big men that aren't necessarily the same level of footballer. So is there talent coming? Absolutely. I would hope so. Uh, the last couple of years, you know, the one thing that is into, I, I suppose Jack O'Connor would look for Paddy Talley because we had a problem in conceding goals. We had a problem against, which we had a problem yesterday, playing against black blanket defences at times. So today's game, you have to have that footballer with natural ability. And you mentioned something about height wise there as well, or, or physique that, you know, you, every player, and well, I won't say every player, you take the Limerick Horland team, and I'm going to deviate for a second. Their half back line, six foot one, six foot two, they just take over a game and smother the opposition. And that's the way football is going as well. The physique of these Dublin guys, the condition. And we're, we're, we're good there. We're nearly there as well. And we proved it last year by winning. But are they around the county? Again, we'll only find it from our club championship, our county championship. Uh, you must have a player nowadays that can adapt to the new systems because you could be inside an academy at Kerry 15, 16 years of age. You could be the best and most talented forward and you won't survive in the county. And I, like today's game, Colin Cooper will find it very difficult. And that's been honest. And to me, he's one of the greatest forwards we ever had because talent and skill has to be sacrificed for something else you can bring to the game. And you're dead right, size, physicality. And it's a case, Kerry, and it's sorry to say, but we have to look for, for forwards, forwards that can score, but forwards that can also defend. And it's it's a power game as well, Shane. It's running. It's running for that. If you have to run for 55 minutes, then what's coming off the bench? And maybe our bench, you look at it as well. Who would have an impact yesterday? Who would change the game? Maybe you would say Killian Spillane hit a point straight when he came on. So there's a number of factors factoring in. But on the same token, we ran a serious Dublin side. Uh, that were uh, their hunger yesterday. And I, I still go back to that clip, like if and we see it in club games. I'm sure you've been involved long enough as well. You're always to try to translate whatever happened in that war. I, I I was involved in a team here. Uh, I just saw Sai Trali myself and a, another man. We were managing them, and 
you'd find out if that warm up was working, can you take it inside those white lines? And I knew the days they wouldn't. You could see it from the warm up yesterday, and it's not hindsight saying it, and we remarked it during the, the build up to our commentary as well. Dublin intensified their warm up. They were built in fellas, the fellas in the bibs were carry, and they that went on. And I suppose they came out with that attitude and they would that carry straight away. So, yeah, if you to make a long story short or to answer your question in a roundabout way, uh, I would hope the talent is there. And uh, it's brilliant that our club championships come up over the next couple of weeks and our county championship. And uh, there's guys, I'm sure, aggrieved around the county as well. They're uh, fringe players that uh, we should be in there. So it's a chance for them now to put up the hand. And, and uh, I'm sure Jack O'Connor is going to be staying on. Uh, this, uh, look, we're, we're ready to go into Kerry camp that can, can we can build and, and drive on, you know. So when you're doing live, live commentary on a game like this, is it tough to keep your composure? I mean, you want to be excited, excited and project that and... But do you find it difficult or is it just something you love and enjoy? Yeah, I absolutely love it. I, I wouldn't be doing it. I, I uh, My wife calls herself a GA widow because I'm gone uh, for most of the year. And I suppose uh, Ambrose is no different. Uh, yesterday, I did I enjoy it? I'd have enjoyed it at the end of the game if we won. But I, I thought for the first time ever, and uh, the I thought the intensity, I, I felt a little bit of uh, the chest. There was pressure pressure with every move and I suppose with us uh, Shane that once we go outside of Kerry or we wrap it now like in club games we have to be neutral but we can go after teams we can go after the ref to a certain extent and I, I suppose and we have a little bit of success I suppose with GA Gold in the sense there was a lot more people listen to our commentaries uh we we kick the ball like a supporter but I'm also wise enough to say and we'd be and I'm sure if you went back in our commentaries we can be very critical of styles that Kerry play as well uh, sometimes when you're forwards we don't like to, too many backs going forward clogging up the space if we're saying our inside forwards are so good so we can be very critical and in a constructive way of our management and our thing and likewise I, I've been and you can hear it today uh, I'm crediting Dublin what they did to us yesterday but I'm t when I'm doing commentary I'm taken into that zone I'll fight for everything as if I was down the sideline by by uh, with uh, Jack O'Connor, but also you know if if there's a high tackle by a Kerry player, I'd say he's in trouble, and uh, and you would say he deserves the card, and that that's the way we are. And I know a lot out there. Well, a lot would be followers of us, but then there's a, a person just saying these two boys are totally boys, and we're doing the commentary. But look at the end of the day, and you just said it. They are no different to what you do every Monday morning on your podcast. Uh, you absolutely love it, and obviously, and I'm trying to butt you up here now. Uh, you do a great job, and genuinely, whether it's hurling a football, I, I chew it in, and uh, you know that's the way it is. And uh, look, are we so fortunate as well? And up there where we were yesterday, Shane, we were level seven, the Hogan, meeting the likes of yourself and other lads, and uh, inside in that canteen and discussing and the friends you make through through the GA, be it a, a parish rivalry, be it anything. It's what keeps us going. But I do feel that the game is changing that we're a bit removed from clubs to county. I remember I, I was presented Terrace Talk here in Radio Kerry uh, a few years ago, and I had David Corkery, remember the, the wing forward for Ireland? And he made a very good point. He was fighting the cause for clubs in Munster, and he said the minute Munster became club Munster, clubs would suffer. And I have a feeling clubs are suffering, suffering because the county thing has gone to an elite level. It's gone to a serious level. And around our own county here, and you'd see clubs are suffering for numbers like South Kerry has been decimated because families have got smaller. Uh, likewise, you know, maybe not a lot of employment there. So they're struggling to keep the game alive. And even at underage level in, in South Kerry, you have three or four games amalgamated to play a minor championship. And that's happening. And, and we see where, and, and you know what? It kind of parallels with Dublin where you have built up areas like David Clifford's now, the Fossa, likewise Kate Common, I'm sure you're familiar with the name. They're around Killarney. They're built up. But if you go out to Asti, and I hope they don't mind me mentioning it, a small club, rural area, they're fighting to keep the game alive. So I think the G has a serious look to, to, to keep these clubs alive. But there's a huge gap between, I suppose, the role of the volunteer and the elite level. And it's not going to come back to us. It's gone to another level. For a, Kerry are going looking for money now, I'm sure, to get this team going next year. And that's what it is. You've, it, it, it's gone to another level. It, it's a game of money, and you can see that. I, I think there was four teams uh, a couple of weeks ago. Somebody put it up on, a, a, on Twitter that, you know, you, you have the likes of Dublin, 
uh, they have AIG, Kerry have got Kerry Group, uh, Glan B for, for, for Kilkenny, and likewise JP and his entourage for Limerick. So they, they're big, big players and sponsorship, and that'll tell you where the game has gone. Mm. Very interesting point here from Adrian McGrath talking about David Clifford uh, and he said Clifford's performance should be a bit of a break on the lunacy around him. He's outstanding but he blew up, that's fine, he's not a robot. Let's wait until he's 30 to crown him the greatest ever. And I do think about, you know, club games with Fossa at junior level and you, you've got like thousands of people showing up and everyone constantly talking about him. Like, it, And he does seem a bit impervious a lot of time when you talk to him. He's just a nice, normal fella. I remember chatting to him about snooker, about different things like that. Celtic, his, his love of Celtic. But like, there, there is a serious focus on the guy that... I, I don't know if any player has ever had this focus in GA. No, uh, no, they haven't. And look, I, I know they say it, and I have said it, that to me, he's the greatest player of all time. I've seen, uh, well, in my lifetime anyway, like I, I've seen Mikey Sheehy, I've seen Colin Cooper, uh, Morris Fitzy, uh, but I think this guy is an amalgamation of all three. He brings the class, you know, the physical presence, the panache, the dash. Uh, I've never seen a player, like when he, he has to get security off a pitch because in case somebody gets hurt, because kids go out over barriers and they want, and do you know, at, at times, Shane, I've actually, I've got pity for the man. I, I've pity in the sense that if he's walking the street, then you want to get hold of him, go have a chat with him just to him say, but he comes from a, an amazing family. And, and, you know, it's something I probably didn't mention. I, and we, and I, it's been mentioned, I suppose, uh, over the last couple of days that, I was watching the Oran Avin yesterday um, at the start of the game on the big screen to our left of the, of the commentary position. And I was looking at, of course, the camera again, focusing in, who David Clifford. And he was looking to the ground. And I'm just wondering, I, in that particular moment, what's going through his mind? Because 12 months before that, his mom was over in the Hogan stand with his sister, with his father. And that meant a lot to him. Suddenly she's gone. And, and I, the man is still grieving. Like you, he, He's only buried his mom a, a number of weeks old. Likewise with Paddy as well. And I, I you know, he is hot pop property, Sissy. And I don't know, to me, he should be an ambassador for, like, could you imagine, and with all due respects, going up to Leitrim or Louth, a David Clifford walking into your, your schoolyard or to take a session or whatever. I, I, I think the G are losing out here. And that that's with it. And it's not because he's a carry man. He could have been born in Dublin as well. He's, his parents were, were working there. All I'm saying, I think we have something very special, uh, no different to Keen Lynch and Hurling, I'm sure you'd agree, that when you have something as big and as hot property as that, and I've never I've never seen the attention, and part of it caused problems yesterday, that I thought he had the weight of every parish in Kerry, every club in Kerry, every county in Kerry, and likewise beyond, because ticket sales yesterday, Shane, or for the weekend, for the game. You know, a lot of clubs around the country, and you'll be familiar with this, they get a certain amount of tickets and they send back, say, one or two in the club might want to go to see the other. No tickets were coming back because they, what they're saying, they're raffle the tickets. And if you're a normally person out there, or a GA supporter, you wanted to go and see David Clifford. And that's how big it was. And and uh, I, I think we need to get control of it. He, ha You know, since he put on... He, Remember that Hogan Cup where he played with St. Brendan's? They won the Hogan Cup. Then he followed up with two All-Ireland minors. And, of course, that big score uh, was a 4-4 he scored against uh, Derry in that All-Ireland final. He hasn't had a break since 2019. We've actually owned his life. And I, I remember I was with him. I know him very well. I know his family very well. And I remember last Christmas we were out uh, in Tipley Banton. They do, which is a great cause. They, they light, this man lights uh, up his whole... Uh, house uh, with Christmas lights and he gets you know celebrities to uh, you know turn on the lights and David was one of those celebrities there that night and I met him I was chatting he said Tim I got to get home because he was away all week and he had to got to get home to his partner and he sat in I had to take him away the, because there was there was people from Wicklow there that night for the turning off on the light can you imagine uh, three weeks before Christmas bad weather they drove all the ways down from Wicklow and Carlo and I said, this is amazing that they, they want a piece of David Clifford. So I got him away from the crowd. I got him into the car and I brought him as far as Abbey Field and somebody else collected him. So I've never seen that in amateur. I, I think you understand what I'm saying. I've never Ooh. seen that in the amateur game. And it's absolutely frightening. And, and today, and even down here, I'm sure there'll be a few texts going into Radio Kerry questioning what he did yesterday. And that really annoys me. And anybody, I, I, and I know you probably had 
no different to yourself or any, going through life. We all had it at times. They criticize us, but I don't take any notice of it. It used to get to me years ago. If you'd say something on the radio and they go after you, uh, I, I think people should listen, listen to themselves first and think of the minute you press uh, that keyboard, the consequences that, you know, and they do. We're all we, we, we're all human. And that sort of gets to us. But he's a, he's hot property. Uh, the G, we're very fortunate to have him. And because Fitzsimons and the Dublin uh, defence yesterday helped him, this guy's going to be here for a nice few years. We, we're going to see big days. And, and it. His best game for me was never, he's been some brilliant games with Gary. It's with Fossa winning uh, the junior premier here. Like, no, you think the junior, a lot of people think junior, maybe the standard is poor, but the junior premier in Kerry, there's teams from Division One, the county league playing it. And he played Listry. And in the other day, Listry should have won the game to the dirty, wet day in Fitzgerald Stadium. He kicked 2 12. And some, as we call him, some sick pints during that game. And, uh, he just grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and won it. And I think yesterday, that's what he tried. He was forcing it too much. He was saying, I have to go. What will I do next? And try and all that. And when you're human, things, we do make errors. But yesterday, it wasn't about David Clifford's, uh, you know, uh, misses. It was about how good Dublin were in dealing with us. Mm, I think that was very brilliant, brilliantly put, Tim. And just that insight was, especially around the Christmas lights, was quite something. Um, just before I let you go, a final uh, thought then. The Kerry ladies footballers, they're true to the All-Ireland. They beat Mayo 116 to 111. Now, I'm not entirely sure if you saw the match or not, but Louise... I was taking it, yeah. I was doing yeah. it. We did it on our way up, yeah. Yeah, so, like, they're going to face Dublin in the final, who, you know, dismissed Cork pretty comprehensively, 219 to 13. And this is going to be the first final between Dublin and Kerry. We've already just had one in, in the men's side, but uh, are this, is this Kerry team going to go ahead and do it now? Yeah, it's amazing. I, I'd be there. They were down to Watford in the first round of the... Uh, the league and uh you know pilt on the game was supposed to that to tell you the weather was poor that day and uh i think it, it was supposed to be on in 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 Dungarv and they moved it across the border to, to pilt town in kikini and they won by a point that day and they ran through the league obviously uh, league champions uh, and got the right result and then when they hit the most championship they played carp they played they played eight games away from home uh, shame which is a very difficult task as well i i can't understand that how that happens Somebody has to explain it to me, but well, that's the way it's organised in the in the ladies' game, or that's the way it felt for Kerry. But they got very tired uh, towards the you know after two or three games in the championship, and you could see it was just tiredness. But you know they had a couple of breaks again. Then when you face the Munster Championship uh, or the, the All Ireland series, and it did help the cause. The only thing I, I am worried about, and there was some brilliant performance like Caught Lynch, Castle Island Desmonds, Emma Costello, who would be, and you probably Jack Sherwood. Remember Jack Sherwood, the player with Kerry. That's a, a Jack's sister, outstanding footballer, Lorraine Scanlon in the middle of the field, Louise Galvin uh, as well. Uh, we depend a lot on, just like unfortunately, again, just one player, Louise, uh, Louise Nimur what, what, what She hit 110 the last day, um, uh, you know, the last day uh, against Mayo. So you you feel the teams will gear towards stopping her or get possession. And we we're, were playing with the wind in the first half and we wrapped up a good score. We always know Mayo will come back to us. Uh, but She's just like Clifford. She's so cute. She was doing the right things at the right time, buying the foul and uh, popping it over the bar. So it'll be very interesting uh, to see what will happen in the final. And the one thing, I suppose, we are leaving the flags up in Kerry. Uh, they're still up from the uh, support, the gents at the weekend. And it was a pity the semi-final was lost and all this build up to the, the men's game. So uh, uh, you know the Dublin supporters are allowed numerous. Uh, you know, they have only to go down the road and walk in the gate. And... Uh, the expense of everything nowadays, look, from the southwest we have. But the latest game, the, this, uh, uh, the latest game in Kerry was in Tormail six years ago. And now we find ourselves Division Two champions, Division One champions, and All-Ireland final last year, Shane. So, look, I hope a lot of players are playing well as well. And the bench is quite strong now as well with Kerry. But a huge loss is Sheaf O'Shea. Uh, she's lost in. Uh, she's got a second cruciate, a terrible injury over oh, the last yes. couple of weeks. So, But look... Uh, We'll be there again and we'll be shouting and roaring, I suppose, and fighting for every free kick and fire every pass. And sure, look, we'll just boot a referee if we don't get him. <laughs> That's yeah, of course, we get away with it. But look, isn't it great, Shane? What, what would you be doing this morning other than talking about sport? And I mean, we're so fortunate, to, you know, every, and you know well, in your family, in my family, uh, it isn't all rosy, you know, health wise and different things. And we're so fortunate, I think. We don't realize how good it is to have. Uh, a pastime and, and something that we're passionate about. It's uh, no different to, we'll say, Tipperary, Kikini, all those strong 
counties now Limerick now uh that you know that it's in every parish we've something to cast whether it's a good day or a bad day you've something to talk about the fallen day and and we should be so proud of our nation that we have two field games you know hurling spectacular and likewise football that you know it keeps us taking over we've something even for this is a bad day for Kerry we lost but like we're fighting now to be back in Croke Park next year. There's other teams trying to take us down already, planning, and uh, we just have to go with it. And uh, I suppose Dublin are shopping close. What are the 31 titles now? 39. Yeah. Our, we were going for our 39. They're getting too close for comfort. Uh, yeah. We have to take this thing serious again, Shane. Well, look, Tim, brilliant to have you on the show and uh, another great year of commentary at Radio Kerry, although you've that final to come uh, to come up next um, against Dublin and ladies. So thank you very much for joining us. Brilliant stuff. Thanks for the opportunity. And we'll, we'll keep clued into you and listen to you. Uh, great panel, great discussion. And uh, you've got the good guys on. Well done. Thank you very much, Tim. All the thank best. You. Thank you. OK, so that was great to have Tim Moynihan on there. I'm sure you agree he gives some uh, excellent insights there, particularly that stuff around David Clifford and, you know, what life is like for him. But, um, yeah, Dublin won the other semi-final in the ladies, 219 to 13 points. Hannah Tyrrell and Carla Rowe scored 1-2 each. They were fairly dominant throughout there. Denise O'Sullivan scored eight points for uh, Cork. They all came from freeze. Just a couple of other bits of news. Ethan Rafferty, uh, the Armagh goalkeeper, of course, he said for a lengthy spell on the sidelines, picked up a suspected leg and ankle break uh, playing for his club. Jake Morris is going to need surgery on his eye socket after what happened um, in the North final against Kiladangan when he took a bit of a hit from, well, a big hit from, from James Quigley uh, late on in that game. Um, in club hurling over the weekend, De La Salle, they beat uh, Dungarvan 3-23 to 217. Ruben Halloran scored 12 points from freeze. Michael Kiley, he scored not the inter-county hurler now, it was two Michael Kiley's, he scored 13 from freeze as well. Uh, Mount Sion were beaten by Four Mile Water and I don't think everyone would have expected this because Four Mile Water were something like 3-1 to one to win the game and there was three red cards for Mount Sion in the game. Now Mount, Mount Sion are managed by Kevin Ryan, who's the former Offaly manager and part of the backroom team then is Parik Fanning, who's a former Watford manager, Liam Dunn, who's the former Wexford manager. So they've a fairly high-powered management team there. Didn't go their way. Three players sent off. Mikey Dakin, he was sent off for two yellow cards. Jamie Gleeson, he got a straight red card for a late tackle in the 53rd minute. And Austin Gleeson, who'd scored a brilliant sideline earlier in the game, and he was switching position throughout, he got a straight red in the 58th minute for um, for connecting with Fionn Hallinan as well. So... With the couple of straight reds going in next week against Tallow, that's going to put them under pressure straight away. Michael Morrissey, he scored 1-3 from play on his senior championship debut. And Sean Walsh, he also scored 1-3. Um, Four Mile Water had 11 different scores, which was great for them. Bally Gunner probably had their worst half of hurling in the first half against Abbeyside, but eventually they came out 121 to 16 points ahead. So that's 51 games defeated in the Watford champion ship there barry cockland there's talks that he might be um in injury bother for the championship rowan moore beat list more dan shannon he was on the bench there um just then moving to tipperary so i was watching some of these games over the weekend boris lee and clonalty ross moore they drew 113 each so there was a lay free from eddie ryan who of course was one of the star players for the tip under 20s this year that salvaged a point for tipperary who or for uh boris lee i should say who um you know not the greatest performance i've seen Missed a lot of chances early on. Connor Kenny, but a few uncharacteristic ones. He eventually scored a brilliant one from the, the sideline um, early in the second half, but four had gone awry from the first half. Uh, James Devaney had scored a very good goal for Boris Lee. The inside force for Tenolte missed an awful lot of chances and probably could have won the game if more were converted. Carl Burke was good in the freeze. Michael Ryan Winnie was very good in midfield. And I thought Enda Heffernan was very solid in the backs. Then on the... Um, I, and the other game in the group, Thurless, they had a great start against Kiladangan. Uh, nice goal early on, but ultimately Thurless lost 117 to 223. Now, in terms of getting out of the group, like the teams that won the divisions, the, the North, South, Mid and the West, no East and Tipperary, of course, the teams that won those, they will get a preliminary quarterfinal guaranteed. So like in the other game, Clonolty, they don't have to worry if they don't get out of the group, they're guaranteed the preliminary quarterfinal. Thurless won the mid, so they don't have to worry about it either but Kiladang and do and they won this game so it was a huge win and Billy Seymour scored a rocket of a goal early in the game there was a puck I think it was a puck out it was certainly a long delivery over the top he outpaced Dennis Maher who was playing the holding six and uh, just coming in at a narrow angle towards the edge of the penalty area just flicked it up off the stick 
and smashed it into the into the back of the net. It was a brilliant goal. But not having Ronan Maher definitely had a huge impact on Turles in this game. And Dennis Maher definitely struggled a little bit at six. Um, and in one of the other groups, Drum, they beat Nina 219 to 120. And Drum were pushing for goals late on when maybe they had a little bit more t- time to just pop off a couple of points. But uh, that was a very tight game. Jake Morris, he, he wasn't playing, as I kind of mentioned earlier on. Some of the other games across the groups, Holy Cross, uh, they beat Upper Church 216 to 113. Mulna Hone beat, beat J.K. Brackens uh, 216 to 15. Tumi Vara fairly scotched Killer One McDonough, who are the county champions, 316 to 15. Mulcarkey Burris and Ross Gray drew 21 points to 118. And Temple Derry, they were beaten comprehensively for a finish against Lockmore, 418 to 426. So plenty of uh, other uh, fixtures across the country. And please do get your comments in. Uh, in the Premier Football Championship in Cork, Castlehaven drew with Carberry Rangers. That was 11 each. Nemo beat Balancholic 211 to 6. Plenty of other games going on there. In Wexford last week, St. Anne's, they lost to Faith Harriers. Then also Glen Barrentown, they lost to Oilgate Glenbrine. St. Martins, they... Uh, they lost to Fate Harriers. St. Anne's beat Navena. Owler to Bala 124, Ratnewer 117. Ferns 217, Cross of Big Valley Mern 20. Shell Maliers, they drew with Rapparees. And in Clare, Valier, they beat Ina Kilnamona. And there's a load of other fixtures as well. And we'll go into it in more detail later in the week. So that's it from the, the, the show this week. We'll be back, of course, later in the week. We'll have a load more to discuss. If you want to get the audio podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. And by the way, if you need to run a club fundraiser, get on to us at events at our game.ie and we'll, uh, we'll look after you there. So that's it from the show and we'll chat to you again soon.